welcome everyone. This week's uh, session is going to be on the role of ECHO in ARDS and we're really going to try and focus it in on the DDU sort of written and vivas um, to help those that are thinking about sitting the exam. And it'll be about 30 minutes to 45 minutes long and please ask, you know, lots of questions and things and we'll just keep it very interactive, hopefully. Um, so let's get started with the type of written question. Let's move this out of the way. That we that is really common for the DDU exam. So this is a variation of this or is likely to come up with the exam. Um, so a 65 year old patient with hypoxic respiratory failure and deranged liver function tests. And you'll have 15 minutes to describe the role of echo in your management. Um, so how might you, how might you think, I guess, without seeing the, the things that I've put down here, um, what kind of opening statement might you, might you put down for that? Any volunteers? And feel, yeah, feel free to shout out some, some answers, Kylie, if you have any thoughts, how you might sort of open, open that question up. Oh, I was uh, sorry, Emma. I was just considering um, <laughs> the wrong sort of answer. <laughs> so I don't think I'll be any help for your DDU trip care here. Me, I would immediately start with the lungs and the lungs. liver and then move on to the echo. But I don't think that's what you mm. want. Sorry. I, I completely agree. And I think if it said the role of ultrasound in your management, um, then then absolutely and i think that's what all of us would do in 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 clinical practice wouldn't we with um you know combining heart lung and and maybe some liver although i'm not very good at it myself but yeah this one is yeah more thinking about i guess a you know patient with let's say ARDS um and they've got bilateral infiltrates and you're trying to sort of establish what's going on so the way that i would um sort of open this out, it would be something along the lines of, um, you know, ECHO has a both a diagnostic and potentially a therapeutic role. Um, the differential is broad um, and the need for something about the need for repeated imaging um, after intervention or if there's a clinical deterioration in the patient. Um, and then, you know, that ECHO is an extension of your clinical assessment um, and should be used in that way. And then I would go on to, I guess, divide it up into the diagnostic role it has, I think, in this, um, in the context of hypoxic respiratory failure with bilateral inf um, as well as potentially a therapeutic role, which we'll come on to. So in terms of the diagnostic uh, role of ECHO, I think it can be divided up into um, thinking about the left side of the heart and then thinking about the right side of the heart and the pulmonary circulation. So in terms of the, the way you might start it off with the diagnostic role would be to establish whether there's raised left atrial pressure or not. Um, so what are the ways that we could could do, do that? What kind of things are you thinking? How could we assess that? <clears throat> Uh, I guess you could break it down into like what your 2D images look like. Um, so what would be suggestive of, of raised left atrium? Yeah. Um, I guess the size of the left atrium. Um, yeah. And you know, if there's bowing of the intestinal right. septum from yeah. left to right. Yeah. Um, well, would it, if you had raised left atrial pressure, what would the intraatrial septum be doing? Yeah, yeah, so fixed, fixed sort of bowing. That's really nice when you get those kind of situations, but it's not often that common, hey? And I guess a raised and left atrial size doesn't, um, you know, you can have a normal left atrial size and still have raised left atrial pressure. And I guess we see that a fair, a fair amount of the time in critically ill with, you know, acute sepsis and ARDS and, and things like that. Um, and then, you know, the best things that we have for assessing raised left atrial pressure are the ASC guidelines, you know, the diastolic dysfunction guidelines. And that is, you know, the, the, they're not perfect, but they are the best, um, you know, toolkit we have, I guess. So, I, you know, going through that, you don't, in this answer, you've only got 15 minutes. So you're not going to completely critique the entire ASC guideline, but you're going to start off with, you know, making an assessment of left atrial pressure. You want to know, is it raised? Is there a cardiogenic element to the, to the lung infiltrate and hypoxia that you're seeing? And then the, the question to follow on from that would be, why is there raised left atrial pressure? Um, you know, is it because there's 
the diastolic stress test of critical care and mm. someone with previous diastolic dysfunction and normal left atrial pressures has now developed left atrial pressure, which I think is a fairly common scenario. Or is there valvular pathology, mitral or aortic valve pathology, or is the patient volume overloaded? Um, so that's that's one diagnostic role. And I think most of us probably start there because we want to know whether we need to give the patient diuretics and certainly whether if we give them more fluid, we're going to push them into, you know, worse uh, state that they're in with their hypoxia and worse in pulmonary edema. Um, so that's one so, end of the circuit. Sorry, okay. Excuse my ignorance, but if you diagnose diastolic dysfunction, that automatically means you have that raised left atrial pressure. Right? No, 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 excuse me. So I guess you've got um, different grades of diastolic dysfunction. So yeah. you've got someone in, you know, someone with mild diastolic dysfunction, by definition, would have normal left atrial pressure. Yeah. And then patients with moderate and severe diastolic dysfunction, by definition, have That's raised good. left atrial yeah. pressure. Okay if we're using the guidelines, which are not perfect, but I think, you know, rather than, and then a lot of our patients, of course, fall into that indeterminate group. And I'll show you some things um, that I do in my clinical practice to try to get around that, um, which I'll come to, but yes, but generally that's how we sort of divide it up because the key thing that we want is intensivist, you know, we're not following these patients up in, you know, for their hypertensive heart disease and, and their, um, diastolic dysfunction we've got an acutely sick patients with ARDS and the question we want to know is whether the left atrial pressure is up or not and so the you know the <coughs> diastolic dysfunction guidelines really was the first um, you know sort of thing that was out there that really started to try to differentiate between diastolic dysfunction and raised left atrial pressure mm. and they've been they're pretty good um, and then, you know, moving on to the other diagnostic role, I think, is in terms of, you know, we're coming from the left atrium um, through the lungs. And I completely agree, Kylie, we'll be looking at, at the lungs as well. And I think that's part of a multimodal strategy, which we'll come on to. And then thinking about the, the impact of the hypoxic respiratory failure in ARDS on the right ventricle and the pulmonary hemodynamics. Um, which I'll come on to in more detail. And then another diagnostic role of it, I think, is in the context of detecting shunts, particularly open PFOs and right to left shunts, which we'll talk through. And then in terms of its therapeutic, and there's so much to write about there already in 15 minutes. Um, and I think it's pretty hard to keep to time to this one because it is so broad. But those would be like the three main diagnostic headings, I think. And then in terms of the therapeutic role, you, we could talk about serial scanning. So if you've changed PEEP or you've diuresed the patient or you've started them on a new, I don't know, inodilator or something, then sort of repeating the imaging to see what the impact is on the, the circuit, the left atrial pressure side of things and the, the RV and the pulmonary hemodynamics, you know, whether you've worsened shunt, things like that. So some mention in this answer about serial you know, scanning is important. And then the therapeutic role in terms of assessing your volume status and um, changes you make, whether you give fluid or you, you diarrhea the patient. And then maybe, maybe there's a role of echo, you know, in terms of lung ultrasound, in terms of looking at lung recruitment. Um, and I know there's a little bit of literature on that. I'm not, I don't do that in my clinical practice, but I think it would maybe worth half a mark or something. I mean, I'm obviously not an examiner, but um, just having chatted to Sam about this and seeing his previous lectures, you know, sort of just being broad about your answer and then really honing in is seems to be the way to go with this type of question. Any questions on that before we, um, we'll just explore these different areas a little bit more. Um, just a question. You know, the role of echo, is it similar to role of ultrasound in your management or uh, because I've always got confused you know, because we could also look at ultrasounding the diaphragm or using vascular access. Yeah, absolutely. Ravi. And I think in this type of question, um, you know, they're probably going to say role of echocardiography because imagine having the role of ultrasound, you know, we could go on forever and be, and it's 15 minutes. So I think in the type of question where they're talking about, 
um, undifferentiated hypoxic respiratory failure with bilateral infiltrates. The crux of the question is going to be about raised left atrial pressure and effects on the RV. Um, and so I think if they wanted to pack in ultrasound there that, you know, as you say, you could talk about diaphragm, you know, go into detail about lung ultrasound, vascular scanning, all of that. Um, so I think it that will be the, the crux of this kind of question. It'll be they want to hear about raised filling pressures and effects on the RV um, and pulmonary circulation would be where the, the majority of the marks are going to be. Um, you know, as opposed to when they have the trauma questions, when they talk about describe your the role of ultrasound and they want you to be broader, talking about um, all the things that Kylie gave in her wonderful lecture with, you know, looking at the aorta and fast scans and, and all of that stuff. Um, sorry about the the old PowerPoint style there with that fading in and out. But anyway, um, yes. So I guess, you know, when we're thinking about the role of echo in ARDS, we're going to be systematic um, and try to establish whether there's, you know, raised left atrial pressures. That's really what we want to know. We know that they can coexist. We can have overlap of non-cardiogenic and cardiogenic ARDS at both ends of the spectrum. And then we have that overlap. And I think most of our patients probably, I mean, I don't know the numbers, we don't have that data, but there is a fair amount of overlap, overlap I would say, in these two groups. So yes, just starting simply, you know, a little line or two on LV systolic LV size and systolic function, because obviously if you've got systolic function, you're going to, by definition, have some degree of diastolic dysfunction, and that raises your propensity to raise left atrial pressure. Um, and then we come on to the, you know, the best that we have, I guess, the ASC guidelines um, of, of assessing that, and we'll, I'm sure, we'll go over that in another time. It's not the it's not that you don't have to really dig down in this question, yeah, I, I think. I think the systolic function is important, isn't it, with the altered LFTs? Because, I mean, cardiogenic shock, um, you know, maybe it needs a little more than one line. I don't know. I mean, is that... It's it's where your money's going to be. So I guess when they're talking about bilateral infiltrates and hypoxic respiratory failure, I don't know, oliguria, mm. LFTs, the coagulopathy, that's kind of the stem. Um, and it will be more, is there raised filling? Mm. But, you, yeah, you would, you would need to write that. But um, I guess forward flow in and of itself doesn't give you bilateral infiltrate no. and, and hypoxic respiratory failure. Um, but you're right, yeah, I think, but the, I think the, mon the money for the question is going to be raised filling pressures mm -hmm. and RV effects. And yeah, I guess, I mean, the, you'll, you'll know, as you see more of the questions, mm -hmm. you'll come to see like what the, where the money's going to be. Okay. Um, you won't have time to start writing about tamponade and everything like that. Um, and again, you know, not classical that you would get bilateral Possibly. fluffy infiltrates, but yeah, I mean, you could write, you know, you could write about many different things, but if it's an ARDS style picture where they're talking about hypoxia, bilateral infiltrates, deranged LFTs, oliguria, all of that, you, it's going to be raised filling pressures and RV stuff. And the, the, the bulk of the money is going to be about talking about the RV, I think, and pulmonary hemodynamics. Um, so this is, I guess, just to, in clinical practice, it's hard just to use, you know, the, the diastolic dysfunction guidelines. And so these are some of the things that I use in my clinical practice. It's far from perfect. It's, um, but it's just a little schema that I sort of go through whenever I, you know, see a patient like this. We had one over the weekend, I guess, um, because I don't want to make things worse by giving someone more fluid if they don't need it. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's some studies that have looked at just simple things like the lateral E to E prime. You know, if that's less than eight, you're very unlikely to have raised pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is how they validated it. And if you've got a lateral E, to, you know, E prime of more than eight, again, you know, you're unlikely to have a really high pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. There's shades of gray and these are not perfect values, but I think if you're seeing those kind of values, then it should cause you to pause and and gather more information um, and then with TTE of course you know assessing using the usual um, uh, pathways that we have with the, the diastolic dysfunction guidelines um, and then Michelle Slama published the paper in ventilated patients where they correlated pulmonary artery catheter um, pulmonary, um, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure to echocardiographic parameters and they actually found that these two parameters out, outperformed the diastolic dysfunction guidelines. And I quite like them because they're, they're really simple. And again, you know, mixed with everything else, they can be useful 
to alert you to possible raised left atrial pressure. So if the E to A ratio is more than 1.5 in someone with a reduced ejection fraction, um, that was suggestive in, in their patient group that were mechanically ventilated of raised left atrial pressure. And if the lateral E prime, and the E prime is less load dependent than your medial E prime, um, especially in the groups where you have pulmonary hypertension, which can bring down your septal E prime as well. Um, so that in those with normal ejection fraction, the lateral E prime of less than eight was suggestive of raised left, left atrial pressure. And I think probably all of us like the ET prime is it is my favorite um but it's not perfect and so i think combining it with other things is is obviously the way to go and it's it's part of the diastolic dysfunction guidelines and then as desh was saying fixed bowing of that septum to the right is going to alert you to raise left head pressure as well and i think as kylie was mentioning there that combined multimodal assessment with lung ultrasound and i think if we're seeing <clears throat> echo features of raised left atrial pressure and we've got lots of B lines, bearing in mind that you can get non-cardiogenic B lines in ARDS. But I think if you've got someone with those features and lots of B lines, you know, you, you're probably not want to, gonna wanna give them fluid is the bottom line. And yeah, I mean, you know, combining these might give us an idea as to what to do practically at the bedside and they're pretty easy to get. Um, in some patients we might consider a PA catheter, um, controversial, but I think it can be useful in the right patient setting. So then moving on from left atrial pressure stuff, so we're going to come to the pulmonary circulation. And things that we want to know is, is there pulmonary vascular dysfunction as a result of the ARDS? So are there, you know, features of that? So what kind of things might you look for with that, Desh? If there's uh, pulmonary vascular dysfunction. Hmm. Um, or raise, you know, like, yeah, increase increased RV afterload and... Uh, so increased pulmonary vascular resistance, you would look at the pulmonary acceleration time nice. and see if it's shortened or not. Um, if there's mid-systolic notching as well, the flying W sign yep. can potentially also lead to um, increased pulmonary vascular resistance. Yep. And then potentially looking at the downstream, downstream, upstream effects, downstream effects of that. So looking at the right heart and um, like size of the RV, size of the, yep. um, uh, looking for if there's any type of flattening of the, or bounce of the um, inter, yeah. interventricular, interventricular septum. Yeah. So right to left um, and where it's happening in the, um, in the cardiac cycle, is it systole, diastole, yep. which will tell you about pressure or volume overload yeah. um, or both potentially. Yeah. Um, what else can you look at? So we've got the, I guess the tools that we have to assess the pulmonary vasculature kind of are the pulmonary acceleration time and the pattern, the notching. So those are two things that you definitely would need to mention in a answer like this. Um, and then what else do we use to estimate um, pulmonary pressures? So you want to get, you want to uh, get a decent TI jet nice. so you can assess the um, RV systolic pressure. Um, and also it's very of the top trimester regurgitation might yeah. tell you about like how like far down the um, RV dysfunction hold the patient is in um, and then that can kind of I guess suggest potentially help you explain if there's any other, other organ dysfunction. Nice question. Yeah, lovely. So I guess, yeah, and then, um, yeah, so thinking about the effects on the pulmonary circulation and then how that impacts the RV. Lovely. So I'm I think all of us in this group are familiar with how to use the Bernoulli equation for TR, Vmax, and, and you remember the sort of, because, you know, in the vivas and things, they might show you a picture like this, and then they'll ask you to critique the image. So just um, being mindful of what the ideal things are, and Benita Anderson's books, I think, are wonderful for that, as well as the guidelines. So, you know, ideally, you'd have your sweep speed, just like this one, at about 100. The scale should be optimised there a bit. You should have your, you see how there's ghosting on this? Or whatever that artefact's called, where you're getting that blackout at the baseline. Um, so so, so reducing your wall filters, um, improving the scale, making sure you've got that closing click. And ideally you wanna average it over three cycles in sinus rhythm. There is some work, cause obviously you're gonna get respiratory variation, uh, particularly when they're ventilated as well. So I think it's Michelle Slama's group that looked at averaging it over three cycles and you use the average one. 
if they're in AF, who knows, but at least five and, and, and go from there and do your best with that. And probably if their heart rate is above 90, we should be correcting for heart rates. But I think practically at the bedside, you know, dividing it by 75 and all of this um, is a little bit tricky. So I often don't correct for heart rate and just look at the trend in that particular patient. Um, particularly if you're seeing notching, you know, you probably don't need to correct the axial time for heart rate then it's going to be short. I think in a lot of our patient group as well, the thing to mention is we don't often get a TR jet, um, which is, um, we just recently looked at this in a septic group, and I think about 20% of the time we couldn't get TRV max, but we could get the Axel time. So I think this is where the Axel time and RVOT pulse wave Doppler can be particularly useful um, in the group where you haven't got that TR jet. Um, or if you are also got free flowing TR and you're getting rapid pressure equalization with the V cutoff sign, then you're going to underestimate pulmonary pressures. And you might say that someone doesn't have pulmonary hypertension when in fact they, they do, but you're just underestimating the pressures um, because of you know, physics and ultrasound, et cetera. Um, so RV size then, they, they would want you to extrapolate on this a little um, and talk about, you know, again, it'll be like a list of bullet points, I should think, um, in terms of what view you're gonna use to measure your RV linear dimension. So what view would we use? Would it be this focused view or the modified view or just the normal apical four chamber to measure RV size? The RV focused view. Yes. So yes. you want to get the RV as quick at its widest. Exactly. Actually. Yeah. So often that little rotation um, end diastole, and then we're going to measure at the base, the mid, and the longitudinal diameter. And the values I keep in my head are 41 at the base, 35 at the mid, and then more than 83 in its length. Um, I think we will get better at sort of. Um, you know, categorizing that because it's really, it's not even adjusted for BSA or mm. sex, is it? It's just sort of a That's little bit random is, in each yeah. patient. And there are, there's some, a paper came out in JACE last year, I think that, that looked at some of that um, and indexing it for, for body weight and what have you. So I, I think things might change with that in the near future. And then of course we can look at areas as well um, in terms of RV size. And, you know, if you had time and things you could write about read like RV volumes um, and how difficult they are in the critically ill. Um, you know, Sam, Sam's done a little bit of work on that and it's, it's not that feasible and I don't think that accurate, but you could mention it for as part of this answer, I think. And then RV systolic function. So the usual things, and again, I don't think you need to go into a lot of detail on these. You just, you would just need to list what the RV systolic function parameters were. Um, so RVS prime, TAPC, fractional area change, eyeballing. Um, and again, you know, some mention about the need for repeated examination and um, depending on the context, et cetera. And then one of my favorites, the upstream effects of <clears throat> the upstream effects of RV dysfunction. Um, so what do we think? So this, what are these profiles? I think the top one is a hepatic vein. Mm -hmm. Top one, pulse wave top one. Yeah, uh, nice. And the second one. And the what second. do you think about? <laughs> what do you think about it? Um. So the thing, I guess, to to, to see whether or not it's severe, I can't You want to see if there's systolic reversal. Um, so just describe this top one to me. Uh, I'm sorry the ECG is being cut off to make the life harder. <laughs> I, I know. Okay, I'll tell you then this one. This one is the S wave, and you should be able to work out. Okay. So if it's systolic reversal, you, sh you should have, like, the signal should go towards the probe, um, right, like, in systole. So that doesn't look like it's systolic reversal. Like yeah. It's normal. Yeah. Um, and the second one, I think, is... Plus the first. Yeah, just stick with this oh, top sorry. one yeah. first. So what are the because what we really want to know, I guess, is is what the you know what the right atrial pressure is doing, mm. and is there evidence of venous congestion and therefore RV failure with organ you know dysfunction mm. as a result of that? Um, because when things like acute 
carpopulmonale progress to RV failure, it means that you are not able to, the cardiac output that you're generating with your RV is not able to sustain low, low and normal filling pressures. So therefore you get high filling pressures. So that's really what we're trying to establish here. Okay. Um, so things that we can look at are obviously the IVC, mm -hmm. size and collapsibility. And we all know those ASC tables estimating the right atrial pressure. But, some, but in the critically ill, sometimes when they're mechanically ventilated, it's not really that accurate. And um, maybe the SVC is better for trying to predict that, but they need a transesophageal echo for that. So the things that we can look at are things like the hepatic veins. Um, and we can look at either the S to D ratio. Mm -hmm. So the S D ratio, and if that's less than one, that can signify raised left right atrial pressures. And then the other thing is the systolic filling fraction um, and I think if that's you trace out the VTIs of the S wave and the D wave and the systolic filling fraction is less than 55 percent then that can signify raised right atrial pressures as well so you can use a couple of different things to sort of estimate that or you can obviously if they have a central line in the best thing to do would just be to transduce the CVP um, but there are much more um, there's much more information however from the hepatic veins than just right atrial pressure um, you can get an idea of the severity of tricuspid regurg, as you said. So what do you think about this, this waveform here then, this second one? Can have any volunteers as well, you guys want to? Is that S wave reversal? Yeah, lovely, Kylie. Yeah, really nice. Um, this was a patient with rip roaring, uh, severe TR, um, and you can see systole here, and then we've got the S wave completely reversed. It's actually fused in, um, you know, with the with the AR wave as well, and just completely fused there. And it's quite. <clears throat> and then we this is the D wave here, and then the S wave again. And it's got this sort of low, you know, sort of low peaking velocity, and it's almost got this sinusoidal picture. And it's probably telling you that there's combined tricuspid regurg and right ventricular dysfunction. Mm -hmm as well so low peaks mean that the yeah not like the low so well. low peaking yeah. sinusoidal sort of pattern is indicative of um tr and rv systolic dysfunction and i think it's um cardio serve that have a lovely um they have a lovely sort of spiel on hepatic pain waveforms they're really nice and it's not very long, but they go over all the different sort of types. And uh, J.O. also gives a lovely talk on the different classic vein waveforms too, and how they can look different. Um, any any spot diagnoses on this kind of hepatic vein flow? The only thing I can wonder is, is that atrial flutter? Yeah, I don't know is the answer. I think it's sinus. Yeah. But it's this um, monophasic inflow that goes on for a long time. Um, it is classic of obstructive lung disease. So when they've got the expiratory airflow limitation, you often see this kind of hepatic vein top of the profile. Anyway, it's just a bit of fun to put in there. Um, <clears throat> and maybe, you know, I think maybe like the cherry on the top for something like this would be to mention the BEXA score, um, which I know a lot of people are, are, you know, very interested in and it's it's um, gaining a lot more attention in the critically ill. And I think for good reason, seems pretty cool. This is a really nice paper where they essentially <clears throat> looked at BEXAs, I think in four or five patients. And they um, looked like before and after intervention. And this was a patient here. So you, you're looking at hepatic vein just there, as we saw. So if you've got systolic flow reversal, look at the portal vein, looking at pulsatility, because that's abnormal. And then looking at the um, interlobular renal veins, the top here is systolic flow. And then at the bottom, this should be a continuous venous flow line. But if it becomes pulsatile, particularly in diastole, that's suggestive of really high um, venous pressures in the kidneys. So you've mm -hmm. probably got the renal injury from, you know, venous congestion. And this was a patient before diuretics and then after, not dialysis, actually. Um, so before dialysis and then after dialysis with two and a half litres removed. It's a really nice demonstration of that, I think. So I think for the cherry on the top, like 
another half mark or something, a little line on this might be quite nice. Um, and then, yes, don't forget the, you know, still sticking to the right side, thinking about those right to left shunts. And um, about 20% of patients have a PFO that opens up and worsening their hypoxia. In the heart. So that's important to mention in terms of the role of echo. So I might just get onto a case now then. Um, Ravi, might you wanna might you wanna do this one? Okay. Like a, a practice diver. Um, so I let you I let you read it out actually because that's what they did to us, didn't they? They made us read it out and stuff. So we'll just sort of practice doing that. You already hit the lights. Sixty-three-year-old male COVID pneumonitis, ARDS second admission, increased shortness of breath, fever of forty degrees. Is on NIV with FIO 2.4, stats of 95%, respiratory rate 35. Past medical history has got two stents on hypertensive. CTP from first ICU stay is positive for PE. X ray showing. Uh, I don't, uh, yeah. Well, on the, you remember, I tried to. Um, Interpret the x ray, do my fiber or not? This is not an x ray exam, move on. So, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, go for it, Ravi. So, that looks like uh, day one. So, epical pre chamber view, uh, which shows the anterior and uh, posterior walls. Uh, what, yeah, what walls are these? So, what wall is this? Anterolateral and uh, uh, posterior, inferior post, uh, inferior lateral, uh, inferior septum. <laughs> which, <laughs> which one? Uh, which one? So this one is is antraceptum. Antraceptum, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, antraceptum, and then this one infralateral. It yeah. used to be called posterior, but I think we should be using the you know the nomenclature um in the guidelines and stuff so infralateral nice um yeah what do you think about this so the lv uh, the walls appear to be contracting well except for the basal part of uh, inferior lateral wall the rest of the walls seem to be contracting well and the lv systolic function appears to be normal in this one so yeah. that's an epical four chamber view is again showing uh, good LV systolic function. Uh, the inferior septal and anterior lateral walls seem to be contracting well. Uh, the left atrium may be slightly enlarged. What do you want to see next, um, Ravi, in, the, in this clinical context? In this clinical context, uh, uh, Pulse wave Doppler at the mitral valve inflow to look at, uh, and then uh, tissue Doppler imaging of the medial and lateral. So we'll do things to look for elevated left atrial pressure. And uh, okay, so I've got some values here for you. Can you interpret that for me? So left atrial volume index is 35 ml, so that's more than 34. So there is uh, left atrial enlargement. E by A ratio is 0.8 and uh, E by E prime is 8. Is that the averaged? That's the averaged, yeah. Okay. And TRV max is 2.2. So only left atrium is uh, mildly enlarged. Rest of the parameters uh, don't point towards uh, so it doesn't uh, satisfy the criteria for elevated uh, left atrial pressure. Yeah, it's kind of in that, I think, indeterminate kind of one, isn't it? Because you've got normal systolic pressure. Um, you know, your your septal one's just less than seven, the lateral one's less than 10, um, but the TR Vmax is not greater than 2.8 and your, um, your E to A ratio, I guess, doesn't come up in the normal systolic function group initially, does it, until they move on to that. And that's because they're, they're 
preload dependent patients if you've got normal systolic function, whereas in the abnormal systolic function group, they're, you know, they can be preload independent. And that's why E, e over A in and of itself can be used to, uh, to comment on left atrial pressures because they're the preload independent patients. Um, so the EA, normal, abnormal systolic function, EA more than two, obviously you're going to have rip-roaring left atrial pressures. But this patient kind of falls in that indeterminate group. Um, and the E over E prime is like eight, so it's kind of just in that gray zone. So it's a little bit tricky. But um, putting it together, you'd say that they probably don't have, you know, terrible uh, raised left atrial pressure. But it, again, it just shows the, difficult, the difficulties that we have in, in trying to use some of these parameters uh, to sort of guide what we're doing. But... Um, I don't know, I, you know, it doesn't seem that he needs to have immediate diuresis, but um, you might be a little bit cautious, I guess, with fluid. And maybe it's someone that you might want to do a passive leg raise on um, so that you can reverse the, the effects of it, you know, and see what his cardiac output and LVOT, VTI and all of that do in response to that. And perhaps how his diastolic parameters change with a passive leg raise. Um, I don't know. So then he, oh yeah, so just a few tips for the, TR jet, I guess this would be someone where you're getting that incomplete jet because you're off axis with your um, angle, your Doppler angle. And then just making a little adjustment, you can get much nicer Doppler, Doppler traces. And what you would do is move your um, probe a little bit more medially and then rock the, rock the um, tail of the probe more medially. And you can often get this nice alignment um, for a better TR jet. Thing there, and we talked about how to optimize uh, these tracings a little bit. Um, and often, you know, if we can't get the the TR jet aligned and everything, and all we've got is subcostal views, and you can get so much information about the still about the pulmonary hemodynamics and the modified subcostal. So I love this view, and you can just drop the cursor kind of right down there, mm -hmm. and often you get uh, really nice uh, profiles. And the important thing is that you trend them out. You know, so if you start off like we had the other day, we had this. 34 year old with pneumonia and ARDS that started off with a you know an axel time of about 110 120 and then by the time he was intubated you know much worse needing proning and what have you the axel time had gone you know right down to the to the 90s and, and trending it is important um all right Ravi do you want to go again on this one uh, let me just play that for you Okay, so it shows uh, on the top left, there is a apical whole chamber view. Oh, it's the, is it the same patient? Yes, yeah, same patient. Okay, so uh, bottom left is the subcostal view. Here, the left, left atrium looks slightly bigger. I don't know whether it's on the same day or different day. Same day, same day. And the interatrial septum seems to be going into the right side. Yeah. Uh, TAPSI is 17, so RV systolic function looks like the longitudinal systolic function looks normal. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the RV in the subcostal view? RV is not dilated. Uh, I don't know whether it is thickened but uh, it's not dilated and it's contracting really well. And the interventricular yeah. septum is not, you know, doesn't look like going into the left side. Nice. So RV pressures don't seem to be high. Nice. And, and what would be a normal upper end, upper range of normal for RV wall thickness? So if you look at the annular free wall, uh, more than uh, five millimeters in, in, in diastole, so the thoughts so far for this guy, I've stolen this off Sam, is that there, you know, there's no real sort of LV systolic dysfunction. We've maybe got normal sort of gray zone left atrial pressure territory. Um, based on the pulmonary hemodynamics that we have from the TR jet and the RVOT pulse wave Doppler, there doesn't seem to be any major increase in RV afterload at this stage. We seem to have a normal RV size and function. Um, and we don't seem to be in a hugely fluid overloaded state. And then the patient deteriorates on day three and maybe, we will get Dash, you wanna go for it? Um, so this is the X-ray on day three. He was obviously 
introverted at that stage, he had worsening metabolic and respiratory acidosis, his kidneys were starting to go, and he was on lots of catecholamines, I think norad and vasopressin, and his respiratory support was escalating. Um, okay, so we're looking at a paratonal short axis view um, at the mitral valve level. Um, I guess the main thing that I can see is that there is the uh, right uh, ventricle is enlarged. Um, it's almost it's probably bigger than the LV um, cavity size at this level and there's flattening of the septum and it looks like it's throughout the entire cycle. Can you slow that down for me? Can you see the red cursor? Yeah. So I think there's flattening throughout the cardiac cycle. So there's both pressure and volume overload. Um, I guess reassuringly, the LV contractility still seems to be preserved um, at this point. So um, but I'd like to see what other views. Um, That's requested. Ooh, okay. All right, uh, so I see a TAPSI um, and an a uh, four chamber view. And uh, this is strikingly different compared to the previous study. So we see both um, RV and right atrial dilatation. RV I'd say is sort of getting up to moderately dilated given that it's almost sharing the apex with the LV um, and concerning signs for RV and RA pressure overload as well with the interstitial septum sort of going into the left atrium. Um, and there's also the septal bounce as well um, in the interventricular septal bounce as well uh, towards the little, uh, left. Um, and the TAPSI is much reduced compared to, to previously. So there is some compromise of the at least longitudinal function and just eyeballing at the fashion area changes also much reduced as well. So RV systolic function is moderately, at least moderately impaired. Um, so do you expect this patient to have some TR? I would think so, yeah. Um, is it, I mean, it, it doesn't. I mean, I can see the, the, the leaflets are coacting reasonably well, but with that yes. degree of dilatation um, and annular sort of um, distension, then I would expect some, at least the central uh, regurgitation jet. Yeah, I think so, because you can just imagine that sort of annular stretching yeah, and you haven't got that coaptation reserve that you would normally have. Yeah, sure. Like three to five millimeters. What do you want next based on the look of that? <sighs> Some color over the tricuspid valve and yeah. um, get to try and get a TRV max so we can assess the other side. Pressure, okay. And pulmonary pressure. Yeah. I'd like to see a pulmonary acceleration time yeah as well yeah. um and looking at the i guess the morphology of the um the trace if there's any notching at all um yeah so. and we're going to repeat the left atrial pressure stuff that you to see sure. whether yeah oh yes see yeah. how that's so, going you can trend well, this is the diastology as well yeah. yeah um anything else that you anyone want to volunteer anything else that they might want to do next in this patient and i just mentioned that he's had a P in his previous exam and there's no reason he might not have had another P on top of it so it would be nice to get another one of those shots down the RVOT and see if the waveforms change. Yeah nice nice Kylie um, yeah lovely I think that's definitely reasonable that's going to be up there right P in your differential for him. Um, would you like want to try and you know optimize patient PEEP and like titrate the Ventilation to see if that would impact the RV size function. Is that, is that yeah, related? yeah, absolutely. So you do your, you know, your diagnostic stuff. Are there raised filling pressures? What's the impact on the pulmonary hemodynamics? What's the impact on the RV? And then your therapeutic sort of role. So you know, maybe we can be using it for 
peat titration. I don't know the best parameter for that. Um, but yeah, this may be, maybe we can look at the, how the TAPSI changes. I don't think that's perfect. Maybe we can look at how the pulmonary axial time changes. Maybe, maybe there's a role for sort of coupling parameters there. I don't know is that there's one good way to look at that. Um, anything else though, based on the intraatrial septum? Um, um, color across it to make sure there's no Subcostal view and uh, color across the interatrial septum to look for any uh, PFO which might open up because of increased uh, right sided pressures. Lovely. So the color is like equivocal. You can't really tell. You think, oh, maybe there might be. Maybe there isn't. I can't tell with the color. That's what happens with it. <laughs> I'm just making that up. You could probably see it, I'm sure, but yeah. Lovely. So yeah. saline bubbles. And this is what we see. Oh. Ooh. Pretty nice. Huh? Mm. That's very cool. Yeah. So he's got a, he's opened up a PFO. And this case always just, just, I don't know, always makes me just think like one the day prior his heart was completely normal and then it takes less than 24 hours later you know mechanically ventilated worsening respiratory failure worsening pbr and it looks like this and he's got this shunt and it's all awful um so you mentioned about the tr jet and these are the pressures that we get about 30 and let's add 15 onto that so pulmonary artery pressures may be around the 45 mark. I'd be worried that perhaps we were underestimating his pulmonary pressures with that because his right atrial pressure is high and his, L, his RV is doing nothing. And so those the rapid pressure equalization with that, although we're not really seeing any V cutoff sign as well to suggest um, you know, severe TR. But I, I guess just taking those values with a little pinch of salt and just being mindful that we can underestimate pulmonary pressures in this context. And that's why I think the additive val value of looking at the shape and the of the RVOT profile, you know, if that's notched, it's a pretty hard to, Sam says, pretty hard to fake that. And so um, I quite like that as an, an additive thing. And then, you yeah, know, axial times less than 90, you know, you're going to have raised PBR. Um, uh, one comment, Emma. Yes. In terms of physiology, for this patient, this is similar to being in acute pulmonary embolism, isn't it? It's like acute core pulmonary for this. Yeah, patient. absolutely. Yeah, and I think it's, it's yeah, and it's very reasonable to think that he could have had more PEs, and you know, if there was no obvious big contraindication, maybe you would just anticoagulate him. He's obviously going to be too sick, I think, to you know wheel him on a transport vent to CT. Um, probably, but yeah, maybe you would start, you know, uh, he's probably already on anticoagulation, maybe you just start a heparin infusion or something and then see how he responds and then manage his ARDS. But look, I think when you've got an x-ray that looks like this, you know, 25 to 40% of patients, depending on the studies that have looked at it, develop acute corpomenale when they've got severe ARDS like this. But yeah, it's hard to tell them, tell them apart, um, you know, because you're going to get that um, you know, RV end diastolic area to LV end diastolic area of more than 0.6 or greater than one if it's severe with paradoxical septal motion, um, which is the echo definition of acute corporal monale. Um, and you can see, you know, you often see McConnell sign and things in, in acute corporal monale from ARDS. So I think if in doubt and there's no reason not to, um, you know, it might be the type of patient that you would start um, anticoagulation on as well. What's that, sir? Yeah, do, I, I do do that in these patients. I do, well, I'm not very good at the lower limb, like the popliteal, you know, distal to the popliteal, but certainly I look at their big um, femoral veins and at the saf femoral junction, make sure I'm not missing a big clot there. Um, have a good look in the IVC looking for clot. Um, and yeah, I, I and generally that if I see that that's negative, um, and I may be worried about the patient bleeding, I won't empirically start. And if they're not, not got any thromboembolic risk factors, like I think I had a low, low threshold in the COVID patients, which we were seeing a lot of PEs in, but um, anyway. And then I guess how to manage this, this kind of patient. Just before you come is... back, I just want to just pick up on one thing you said about the echo definition of core pulmonale. Yes. So I think core pulmonale is both an echo definition and a physiological definition. 
I think showing that you've got that big dilated RV, the interventricular septum being pushed over to one side, but that also needs to be linked in with signs of increased congestion and be that either a weird metabolic acidosis, acute kidney injury or LFT derangement. I think it's a mixture between both of them because I think you do have people walking around with pulmonary hypertension who've got an RV dilation and the septum being pushed over who are not sick. You know, you see people with that echo signs of core pulmonale yes. without the congestion. Yes. And I think the term core pulmonale is almost like it should be reserved for people a bit like shock. You know, you can have someone with a very poor ejection fraction and signs of heart failure who's not in shock. But that's very different from them when we say we've got a cardiogenic component to their shock. You know, I think, I think our terminology should be a bit different and core pulmonale is the extreme of that. Yeah, I agree. And I think, uh, I mean, you've, it's, you've obviously written about this, you know, in in that like that wonderful state of the art paper and stuff. But I, I've also heard. I, I only see I, think, I, I was Antoine writing it stuff. because uh, I was schooled by uh, Pinsky and Anton Vilmos, who yes. said that exactly over the top. Because yes. like, I said, oh, this is Corpano, and they went, oh, hang on, this is uh, yeah. not <laughs> Corpano. There, no, yeah. uh, there is no decongestion, you know. Nice, nice. I, I guess in my head I have that as like right heart failure. So when there's, you know, like there's that spectrum from like RV at risk to acute core pulmonale to right heart failure. Yeah, and I think nice. there are a lot of patients walking around with like chronic core pulmonale, but they haven't got congestion. Nice. Um, and then we have our acute core pulmonale group, which is I think like guys like this, but they're, they're, they're maybe their filling pressures are not super high and they haven't got organ failure. So I, Maybe it's when they fall off the perch from the acute pulmonale and they are starting to get Lovely. that filling, and then that's right heart failure. Mm, I don't nice. know whether. Yeah, I, I think I've thought, read this. I mean, when you said that, I mean, I had like four pulmonale is, is that not heart failure? Mm. To me, to me, they're the same thing, except it's from a pulmonary origin. Yes, and so there's no the physiological. Uh, it's a physiological it's a physi Yeah, yeah. But there are physiological components to it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think there are different opinions on it as well, exactly. like, and the different terminology and different things that you read. So, would yeah. congestion be enough, or do you need actual end organ dysfunction? Or right. Congestion and organ dysfunction. Maybe this is where RV congestion. failure comes into it. I yeah. think I, I think you've got to have some form of physiological congestion for me for it to be calling it cold. Yeah. So, oh, as in not just echo criteria. You mean? Something. There's I echo and physiological to make the definition of core. You've got raised right atrial pressure with it. Raised So if your CVP is raised, but your liver and renal function are okay. Probably in between if you call and <laughs> right heart failure. I don't know. Like I, I'll, I'll have to read what, what Sam's written again. <laughs> He's saying it <laughs> now. <laughs> He's saying it now. I guess we've done a fast cut off since some yeah. of it, but I think uh, oh, the point I was just trying to get is I think it's Core pulmonale for me is not only an echo diagnosis, you have to match it with some form of clinical signs of congestion. Yeah. And maybe we could argue about yeah. the semantics of that. Yeah. Sorry. But there's, there's a, there are clinical components to it. And I think for me, that's what this is all about, right? You yeah. know, it's like with this guy with an acutely going off like that, and these wonderful echo signs of RV failure. The next thing that I'll be looking for is, is there signs of, you know, this is clearly an RV at risk. What do we then have to do? To, where are we on that scale between getting to rip roaring RV failure, which is hard to pull patients back from? You know, I think we, I, I think the important learning point is to when you see stuff like this is to match it clinically and look to see how far we are down the path of that congestion causing more problems than can you pull back? Because as this case so beautifully demonstrates, it goes off fast, you can pull them back fast. If you miss the boat and they go too far, you can't. Yeah. Um. Yes, I mean, these are the, you know, we've gone in 24 hours from fairly normal to acute RV severe dilation. This is Sam's slides, actually. Um, maybe moderate to severe RV dysfunction. We've now got a significant right to left shunt worsening the hypoxia. And there's worsening TR, which, you know, the more you stretch out that annulus and get that, um, you know, that homeometric and heterometric adaptation failing then that's bad and as Sam was saying then you start to spiral and start getting the venous congestion the organ dysfunctions and it's all very bad so these are some of the things that I guess we do all the time you know trying to get their hypoxia as their oxygen 
um, as good as you can get it, not always easy. Often, I think early proning is a win in these guys. Um, trying to avoid any hypercarbia, and again, I think proning helps with that with all the VQ matching. Um, RV afterload reducing strategy. So in this patient, we minimize his PEEP. We start him on nitric, and maybe that got him a little bit better for a while. Um, thinking carefully about diuresis, I have a really low threshold, not to really high threshold, not to start diuresis. What do I want to say? The double negative. I said I start diuresis generally on on most of these patients, um, just to at least keep them neutral, if not negative, and then just do serial echoes and sort of track how they're going with that. Um, maybe I don't know the answer to all this. There's lots of research questions out there, but what is the best presser inotrope um, that we can use in this kind of situation? I, for me, I. I think about what's going to be the thing that's going to maintain that coupling between the RV function, um, whether diastolic or systolic, and the um, afterload effects of the pulmonary circulation, and what things can we use perhaps to maintain that coupling. And I don't know the answer to that, but I don't know. I use early vasopressin and maybe think about adding in milrinone, and I quite like low dose adrenaline, but there's absolutely no evidence to support all of that. Just to help <laughs> a little bit of uh, RV contractility. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, so that's, I think that's kind of how, we'll probably stop it there actually. That's how, so go, I guess just summarizing, you know, thinking about the type of questions and what I would um, suggest, maybe sort of suggest doing for those that are preparing for the DDU would be to start thinking about your own questions early. And then just writing, you know, for the, you know, for this one, um, you know, bilateral infiltrates, hypoxic respiratory failure, worsening LFTs, aka oliguria, coagulopathy. You know that the meat of that question is going to be RV and pulmonary hemodynamics. Also thinking about filling pressures, um, and then, you know, not forgetting shunts and things like that. But and it's fifteen minutes. It's not very long to write it. And then, yeah, I guess um, we'll just keep trying to practice more DDU Viva style cases and um, and just going through that as the weeks go on. And we'll be, thanks for listening everyone. And we'll be back with a new program, sort of trying to think how we can best, um, I guess, tap into the education side of things for the DDU exam um, and the ASE exam as well, mainly. But um, any thoughts, very much welcomed and uh, we appreciate your feedback and thanks for listening. If you learnt something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for watching. watching.